good morning. Thank you for responding to that. That makes me feel 10 times better already. Um, Well, uh, man, I would like to open us with a word of prayer, so bow your heads with me, please. Father, oh, the depths of the riches of your wisdom and knowledge, how unsearchable your judgments and your paths beyond tracing out. Who has ever known your mind, Lord, and who has been your counselor? Who has ever given to you, Father, that you should repay them? For from you and through you and for you all are all things, and to you be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, it's so great to be with you this morning. My name is John Briscoe. Uh, I have a wife and five children, and that is all the backstory about me that you're going to get at the moment. Uh, so, if you want to know deeper into my life at some point, uh, feel free to come talk to me. But let's, let's dive right in. So today I have the honor of bringing you the third message in this series on prayer. And uh, uh, James spoke the first week about talking to God and showing us through Scripture how we need to have a conversation, how we can approach the conversation with our holy and transcendent God. The second week was about talking with God and showing us that we talk with Jesus because he understands our struggles. He can help in our times of need. He actually cares about us and he is our friend. And today as we continue our discussion on prayer, uh, we're going to talk about something and shift into an area that I frankly didn't know anything about five years ago. And that's the concept of listening prayer. And it wasn't on my radar, and of course, I knew there were stories in the Bible about people hearing the audible voice of God, but I didn't think that applied to my life, thinking, how am I supposed to listen to the voice of God? Well, I was encouraged recently by this next statement, and I am going to encourage you with it this morning as well, and it is that you can hear the voice of God, and you have heard the voice of God. And in fact, you wouldn't be here right now this morning if that weren't true. At some point, you felt a prompting and you said, God, I need you. And you decided to show up at Bridgetown Church of Christ this morning, right? So I hope, uh, keep that in the back of your mind. And I hope that you aren't skeptical thinking, well, just because I haven't heard, I haven't heard the audible voice of God. Maybe you have. But if you haven't, don't think, well, I haven't, okay? So our main passage today is going to come from John 10, but we're going to start in John 9 toward the end. So if you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles or Bible apps, if you have those, um, go ahead and open up to the end of John 9. And John 9 tells the account of Jesus, right, healing a man who was born blind and the man ends up going to the synagogue and the Pharisees and tell, and they, they're like, oh my goodness, like, are you sure you were blind? And he's like, yes, I was blind. Now I can see. And they're like, who healed you? And he's saying, I don't know who he was, but this man healed me. And I, all I can tell you is I was blind and now I can see. Okay? And so then they... they uh, not really super happy with him, and he kind of hits him with this zinger. Uh, You can read that for yourself in there. I always love when the Pharisees get it stuck to him. Um, So he hits him with a zinger, and they're so mad, they throw him out of the church, right, out of the synagogue. They're like, you know what? Get out of here. We just cannot deal with you. Um, Talking about this guy who healed you, is he from God? Okay, so we're going to pick up the story where Jesus comes back in, And he is talking to, uh, at first he's talking to this man who was was blind and now he can see. Okay, so we're going to read John 9, 35 through 41. Okay, so it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, 
and those that see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. So one of my favorite themes throughout the Bible is humility versus pride. It shows up on almost every page. And in this account, Jesus relates humility and pride to blindness versus seeing. The blind man humbles himself to worship Jesus as soon as he knows that was who healed him and that he was the Son of Man. He immediately proclaims him as Lord, and he's completely focused on the healer. The Pharisees are focused on themselves. They say, who cares about this miracle? This Jesus guy healed you? Who cares? It doesn't matter. We just don't want you talking about him because we don't believe that he is the chosen one, right? They're so blinded by their own faith in their own righteousness that they couldn't see their need for forgiveness or the Messiah standing right in front of them, asking them to humble themselves and just believe. Okay, so this next phrase is what the big takeaway for this morning. And I am not uh, smart enough or wise enough to come up with really clever sayings or things that rhyme, so I apologize for that. So it's just that humility is the key to unlocking your ability to hear the voice of God, okay? Humility is the key to unlocking your ability to hear the voice of God. And what I mean by humility is not thinking lowly of yourself, but a more biblical definition of the term, and I believe that is willing surrender. There has to be a willingness to your surrender for it to truly be humility. True humility is saying to God, I can't do this, but I know you can. All throughout the Bible, right, God blesses those who are truly humble, and he steps in and he does amazing things. In the Old Testament, Joshua, who took over leading Israel after Moses passed away, says to the Israelites, right before they cross the Jordan to the promised land, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. To consecrate simply just means to make sacred to a purpose. To consecrate yourself to the Lord is a humble act. So in other words, Joshua is telling the Israelites to willingly surrender their purposes to the purposes of the Lord. And in doing so, the Lord will do wonders among them. Okay, so I want that definition of humility, willing surrender to be in your minds as we dive into John 10. Okay, so we set up what's about to happen in John 10, Jesus' teaching, by looking at the Pharisees, right? They were like, are you saying that we're blind? Okay, so this is Jesus now responding to their question. So he's talking directly to the Pharisees at this point. So this is John 10, 1 through 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way That man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Okay, so in typical Jesus fashion, right, he doesn't, he doesn't take a question and really answer it straightforward, but he uses the opportunity to teach, to use a parable, and the Pharisees are just kind of standing there like, uh, what is this guy talking about? He was just talking about being blind and seeing and not seeing, and if you do, you're blind, and now all of a sudden he's talking about sheep, and like what is going on, right? So they're really confused, okay? So let's break down this parable a little bit, see who we're working with, and uh, we're very blessed, right, to have the word of God. We can look back, we can look forward, we can dive in, and we can kind of figure out um, what, who Jesus is talking about, what he's talking about, so that uh, we don't have to be as confused. So we're gonna focus first. We have the thief, we got the shepherd, 
Uh, we got a gatekeeper, and we have the sheep. All right? So we're going to start with and focus on the shepherd and the sheep. Okay? So the shepherd is Jesus, as he himself points out later in this passage. So that probably not come as a surprise that Jesus is the shepherd. Okay? But maybe to a slight surprise, you may be thinking, well, we're the sheep, right? I get that. Well, we're actually not the sheep. Okay? We are not the sheep in this sheepfold. Okay? He's actually talking to the Jews, right? I promise we're going to come up in the story in a little bit. But right now, these are not us. We're not these sheep. John 1, 11 through 12 tells us he came to his own. Okay? Jesus came to his own, which he was born a Jew into the Jewish people. So he came to the Jews, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay, so Jesus came to proclaim the good news to the Jews first, but not all believed. So in this story, Jesus says that he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The Pharisees and any other Jews who didn't believe in Jesus are still in the pen, right? Jesus came in, the gatekeeper opened, and he's like, you know, all who are mine come out. And so those Jews that did not recognize his voice didn't follow him out. So for these Pharisees, not only were they blinded by their pride to their guilt, but also they were deaf to the voice of the Messiah. Their pride causing blindness and deafness. Okay? But what about all of us non-Jews? I don't Maybe some of you who are of Jewish heritage in the room today, I don't know if I am or not. I've never done the 23andMe or, you know, any of those DNA tests. So I, who knows? But who about, what about us? Are we sheep listening for the shepherd? Are we something else? Okay. I told you not to worry. All right. Here are verses 14 and 16. This is where we come into the story. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay my life down for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. (sighs) Okay, if any of you are worried about not being in the story or not achieving the rank of a sheep, be, you know, be, be relaxed and know that you have now risen to the rank of sheep, okay, in the story. So congratulations. Um, and I know there's some people who are like, well, I don't want to be a sheep because, right, our culture, we associate sheep with being dumb and mindless. Um, you know, we've all probably seen the videos of the sheep who's caught in the ditch and then he gets pulled out and he immediately runs back and jumps in the ditch, Right? Or I've heard stories myself, it's like sheep are so dumb that if, uh, you know, they're taken to a pasture to graze and if nobody ever moves them, they just stay there and they eat up all of the vegetation and then they just stand around until they starve to death because they're just like, well, it's all gone. I don't know what to do now. What, what do you want from me? Okay? But I'm going to buck this cultural norm this morning and hopefully by the time I'm done, you'll be grateful You'll be thanking me that you've achieved the rank of a sheep, okay? And not because I'm going to prove that sheep are really smart. I am not going to do that, although I was just at the Ark Encounter uh, with my family a couple weeks ago, and we, we met a guy who trains sheep and pigs, and they, uh, we met a sheep who was able to differentiate between different colored balls and even right hand from left hand. So I... I don't know, maybe that's the smartest sheep in the world, but uh, he, he was like, no, sheep actually aren't, you know, like that. you can train them just like you can train a dog to, you know, do tricks and these things. It was like, fair enough, that was news to me. But uh, we are going to look through the lens of humility versus pride as we are talking about being a sheep. And I don't know, but it may very well be that sheep aren't necessarily dumb, but they may be the most humble creatures on earth. Because what is true is that a sheep will follow their shepherd wherever he leads without worrying if it makes sense. They'll trust the green pasture they've been led to and stay there until he says to move. 
They'll let themselves be guided to peaceful waters and whatever new path because they know that the shepherd wouldn't betray them. They can walk through a dark and treacherous valley without fear if their shepherd is with them to guide them. If he shows them a place to rest and eat, they won't worry if they're surrounded by wolves. They'll trust that it's safe. They'll experience the goodness and love of their shepherd and stay in his presence all the days of their lives. So, um, some of you may have picked up that I was slightly paraphrasing Psalm 23. Okay? If you aren't familiar with Psalm 23, let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. That is the truth of Scripture, right? So Israel's second king, King David, who wrote a lot of the Psalms in the Bible, lays out a pretty good picture of what a humble sheep looks like. Now, I think we can all agree that if David, the man after God's own heart, as he is well known, wanted to compare himself to a sheep in the light of the Lord being his shepherd, then we can be glad to have achieved the rank of a sheep right next to him. So I said earlier that you can hear the voice of God, and I meant that because if you're here this morning, like I said, then at some point you heard your good shepherd call to you saying, there is more to life than what you have right now. And you showed up here this morning at Bridgetown Church of Christ. Of all places, you could be in the world right now. Of all the places you could have ended up in your life, through different and various circumstances, you are right here this morning for a reason. And I do truly believe that. Okay? So, be encouraged and that be encouraged that you have the ability to continue to listen to the voice of God. It doesn't have to just be one time. All it takes is choosing to be a humble sheep. So, how do we make all this happen? Right? How do we take the theoretical knowledge and wisdom of the Bible and turn it into something practical? Well, let's look at three things. We're going to look at how does God speak? What obstacles stop us from hearing God? And what's one concrete action step we can take this week toward achieving that? So, I believe there are four categories in which the way that God speaks to us. Um, you know, you can disagree or maybe, you know, James has something really smart um, on the subject. But this is what I've come up with. I believe we have promptings, an audible voice, miscellaneous, and the word. Okay. I love the category miscellaneous, right? Um, so, promptings, right? The Holy Spirit prompts us to do things. And maybe you think, I don't know if I've ever been prompted by the Holy Spirit, okay? Well, I think that it is fairly simple to deduce whether or not you are being prompted by the Holy Spirit, whether you're a believer or not, right? The Bible is, is pretty clear. Like, as a believer, right, you get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So that's the gift, right? But the Holy Spirit is also working all the time to convict hearts and draw people to the Father. So you don't even have to be a believer to be prompted by the Holy Spirit, right? But it says, uh, or sorry, if you are prompted to do something, here's my three-step rule for is it from the Holy Spirit? Is it good, meaning it's not sinful? Does it agree with the truth of Scripture? And does it glorify God? That's pretty simple. If you can say yes to those three things, then you know it's from him. <sighs> should I pray for that guy? Yeah, you should. <laughs> Every time you felt like you should pray for somebody, the answer is yes. Right? <laughs> That's good. It's from, it agrees with scripture and it glorifies God. Okay? Man, should I be generous with that person or that you know, ministry, that chair, whatever? Yes, you should. God tells us, be generous. 
I want you to be a hilariously generous giver, okay? So that is pretty simple and straightforward, right? Because God, he will never disagree with his word. He never will, okay? Second, an audible voice. Samuel 3 tells the account of the prophet Samuel as a young boy under the care of the priest Eli, and Samuel hears the voice of God calling him audibly in the middle of the night. And Samuel keeps thinking that it's Eli calling to him, so he keeps going into Eli's room saying, what do you need? And he's just like, I didn't say your name, I'm trying to sleep, please leave me alone, right? And so eventually Eli figures out, ah, God is calling out to Samuel. So he tells Samuel, the next time you hear the voice, say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Now, I, I've met very few people in my life that have said that they've heard the audible voice of God, but I believe that the Bible is true, and it tells us that God is the same yesterday and today and forever. So if he wants to speak to you or to someone audibly, then he will. If that's what he needs to do, then I trust God that he will do it, and he will use it for his glory. And I think it's pretty simple. If you're hearing voices in your head that don't sound like yours, then I think you can use the same simple formula as we looked at in promptings to know if it's God's voice or something else, right? Because God's not going to tell you to do something sinful. He's not going to disagree with the truth of Scripture, and he's going to tell you something that's going to glorify him in the end, okay? Now, miscellaneous, okay? I've included this category because... I have heard so many stories of beautiful and personal ways that God has spoken to people, and I can't better encapsulate the infinite creativity in which God has spoken except by just saying miscellaneous. And I, I wish I had time to go into to multiple stories of how I've had friends tell me these beautiful little things that have happened to them, but one of the ways for my wife and I was when, uh, well, before Jayla, my wife Jayla, was pregnant with uh, our fifth child, she had asked three, th three friends to listen to God on our behalf about whether or not, you know, is he actually asking us to have another child. And all three friends, not knowing that we wanted it to be a girl, had a dream that Jayla was pregnant with a girl. And sure enough, our fifth child is a beautiful little daughter named June. Okay? So that was one of a very personal way for us that God spoke through friends on our behalf. So I love that that was in miscellaneous. And fourth, we have the word. The Bible tells us that every word is God-breathed in 2 Timothy. It is the voice of God recorded in writing. God has given us this amazing gift. And right now we have the word of God at our fingertips 24-7, right? Right? Millions, billions of copies and thousands of languages and digital access at, on every device in the world. Everything we need to know about God, who he is, what he's done, and how we can follow him is, it's right there. It's right there for us to always, always be able to hear. I remember when uh, about, wow, about six and a half years ago, when I was working for a company called Tiger Fitness, we sold nutritional supplements, um, and uh, we had started a group at uh, Whitewater Crossing, a huddle group, you know, fancy name for a small group. And uh, we were going through the Gospels, and part of the group was committing to, like, reading the Gospels through, and uh, I don't remember exactly which Gospel we were in, doesn't matter, but... It was during that time that Jayla and I started to feel the Holy Spirit prompting us to get back into full-time ministry. And I believe that a big part of that was diving just more intentionally into the Word, reading the words of Jesus, seeing what He is asking us to do. And so I know that the Word, it is, right, it is so powerful. There is nothing on earth that can match the truth of Scripture. And I promise you that is true, not just here in this country, but anywhere in this world. I don't care what you put up against the truth of Scripture or its power, nothing can match it. 
So what about obstacles? Okay, if we look back at John 10, we see that there are thieves and robbers in that parable as well, right? Verse 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The devil wants nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy your ability to listen to the voice of God. And here are some common obstacles that I see that he uses all the time. Distraction, busyness, and deception. We are one of the most distracted cultures uh, in the world. I know I don't need to go into detail about all the things that distract us each day, and I'm sure that just by the mention of distraction, the Holy Spirit probably brought, brought something to mind that is a distraction for you. You already know what it is, but I'm going to give you 15 unbearable seconds of silence to really let the Holy Spirit speak to you about what that is that distracts you every day. Okay, time starts. All right, I lied. That was 18 seconds. Okay. Um, all right, so I, for myself, one of the things that I knew was a super big distraction in my life was social media. And so years, years ago, I made the decision. I said, you know what, that's it. I'm done. I'm just deleting them all. Whatever I've got, I'm off. Um, and it was really hard at first. You know, felt like, oh, I'm missing out. What, am I, what is somebody saying? What is somebody posting? What, is, what if people don't know what's going on in my life if I don't post a picture of my kid eating his cereal or something, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I'm not going to debate whether or not you should get off social media, and I don't believe that social media is evil or anything like that. But for myself personally, it was a huge amount of time that I would waste that I was no longer wasting. So one additional challenge this morning that I'll give is whatever that distraction is, think about it. Put it before the Lord. Maybe he's asking you to get rid of it. Do you really need it? I don't know. You have to ask that question for yourself to the Holy Spirit. Okay? Busyness, number two. Our culture values being busy as one of the highest accolades you can achieve. Right? If you are busy, you are successful. It's the opposite of being lazy, and we don't want to be lazy people. But busyness, I believe, is one of Satan's greatest weapons to keep you out of the presence of God. If you don't have time to be in the presence of God, then you might need to rearrange your schedule, right? Jesus said in, in uh, John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. I believe we can't do anything of significance for the kingdom of God on our own. Only through abiding in Jesus can we truly accomplish anything. Lastly, deception. The Bible describes Satan as the father of lies and that when he is lying, he is speaking his native tongue. He will tell you that you don't need God. You can figure it out. God's bigger, got bigger problems to deal with than yours. God has more spiritually gifted or talented people to use than you. God wouldn't want to speak to someone who's done what you've done. Right? All of these are lies. It isn't good. It doesn't agree with the truth of Scripture, and it doesn't glorify Him. So you can know that it is not from your heavenly Father, but the Father of lies. So... Scripture that has continued to hit me hard uh, recently is from Matthew 7, because Jesus tells us in Matthew 7 there are two kinds of people. One person hears the words of Jesus and puts them into practice. He is wise. He builds on a foundation of rock, and his house withstands the storms of life. The other person also hears the words of Jesus, but he doesn't. Put them into practice. He's foolish, and he builds on a foundation of sand, and his house cannot withstand the storms of life. I apologize if that's me. 
So here is our concrete action step for this week. The challenge is to spend at least one 30-minute block listening to God through his word. And I don't just mean reading the Bible for 30 minutes. I'm talking about meditating on the word. Pick a passage of scripture, even one of the ones that James has had you guys, uh, you know, praying over and using over the last couple of weeks. That could be one. But pick a verse, read it, reread it. Ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to tell you through it. Stop. Be silent. Listen for the truth of the scripture. Don't be concerned with doing and accomplishing. Humble yourself. Willingly surrender to know that spending time in the presence of God and his word is success. Silencing yourself because you know that the creator of the universe is right there with you. That is a beautiful act of humility. And humility is the key to unlocking your ability to hear the voice of God. Let's pray. Father, you are good and your love endures forever. There is nothing that we can do apart from you. And I just want to pray a blessing over everyone here in this room this morning. Now, whatever scripture you point out is something that they will hear and put into practice. Lord, because there is nothing more powerful than your words. And I thank you that we have heard you and that we can hear you and that you are good. Amen. So as we go into a time of communion, I want to focus on how Jesus showed us how to be humble while he was on earth. And his greatest act of willing surrender was to die on the cross to save us from our sins. In John 10, Jesus finishes his lesson with this in verses 17 and 18. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. He is our good shepherd, and he chose to lay down his life for each and every one of us sheep. He willingly surrendered to death on the cross so we could be forgiven of our sins. And he commanded us to remember this sacrifice through communion. So we're going to invite all believers to participate with us. Uh, If you're here and there are packets, hopefully you got one as you came in. Um, So let's take communion together. Jesus ate with his disciples and he took the bread and he had given thanks and he broke it and he said to them, this is my body which is given for you. Do this of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, he said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Drink and remember him together. As often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until his come. 